Buddy? Hello. We're going to get started. Mm. I feel like I have the um, dog ate my homework uh, excuse. It's uh, the, uh, the dog ate my PowerPoint slides excuse. Um, so you're just, this is a talk, so I'm just going to talk. You're not going to uh, have the visual aids. Um, and uh, one of the many reasons why I don't have slides is because I've been goofing around here uh, in beautiful um, San Diego. Um, I just went to High Tech High. How many people have been to High Tech High? It's like four miles down the road. Um, it is uh, an awesomely beautiful, interesting, innovative school. Uh, and I found myself hanging out with um, Larry Rosenstock, who's uh, the, the founder and the CEO. And I mostly remember this guy from about uh, 15 to 20 years ago when he was the absolute most entertaining uh, speaker at the bar about the early works in the, uh, in the charter world. But today, I was struck by my visit to the Graduate School of Education, the High Tech High Graduate School of Education, um, uh, which is also in a beautiful building. And they're training teachers for High Tech High and for other schools and districts in California. And um, Larry said that the school, the sc Graduate School of Education is literally next to with same building as the elementary school. And Larry, Larry said that when he sought to do this, he got a lot of criticism from people who said that there was no business putting a graduate school of education uh, in the same place as a K-12 public school. And um, he was mentored by a guy named uh, Ted Sizer, um, who many of you probably know, although the students there don't. Um, at, and Ted, uh, back in the, uh, he was the dean of the Graduate School of Education at Harvard at the age of 31 and uh, was involved in the small schools movement early on. And Ted said that uh, the only place to put a graduate school of education is in a K-12 public school. It would be to fail to do that is like having a medical school uh, without any uh, bodies or people uh, to look at or operate on. Um, and so I thought that that was kind of apropos of what I was uh, going to speak about uh, this morning in terms of uh, what it's going to take to create the next generation of uh, teachers, because we certainly need a lot more places like the High Tech High Graduate School of Education and a lot more teacher training programs that are nested, embedded in our K-12 schools in order to get uh, the kind of results that, uh, that we need over time. Um, before I get into the, uh, the, 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 the heart of what I want to share about today, which is uh, less about the work that Relay Graduate School of Education has been doing the past uh, five, five to eight years, and more about what the future might bring, um, I just thought I might share. Um, I recently was in um, Camden, New Jersey. Camden's probably got an age cohort of about 1,000 uh, students, uh, grades uh, K to 12, so maybe like 13,000 there. And uh, I, I believe the superintendent is on the record as saying uh, that uh, recently that three out of those 1,000 graduate 12th grade ready for college. So it's, uh, it's a sad place to go to school. And I went in, um, I, I founded something called Uncommon Schools. And one of our uh, schools opened up there uh, recently. And I walked in the, uh, the school. It was started as an elementary school. And I walked in. And I saw somebody, uh, about a five foot one African American young woman um, who uh, looked familiar. Um, and she walked up to me and looked at me in the eye and shook my hand, a uh, firm handshake, looked me in the eye and said, Mr. Atkins? That's my name, Norman Atkins. Mr. Atkins? And I looked at her and I said, Tanaya Christopher? And I realized that uh, 18 years earlier, I had met her when she was a 10-year-old student at the school that I had founded uh, in Newark, New Jersey. 
and I walked into her classroom and I watched her deliver phenomenally beautiful lessons for her five and six year old kids. She had been a drama major at an HBCU and had come back and started training in our program and teaching uh, at one of our schools. And I realized in that moment uh, that there is a virtuous cycle and that our uh, students will be our teachers. And so as I've gone around in the past couple of years, I've seen um, people like uh, Gloria Munoz uh, at Noble Street in Chicago, who was a student and is now a teacher there, or Gio Cruz at KIPP in New York, who was a student and now is a teacher, uh, Shantaria Walker uh, at KIPP Houston, and, uh, and it, goes, it goes on and on. And um, uh, I've, I find this to be one of the most uh, inspiring um, moments in the work that I've been doing the past 25 years in terms of where we're uh, headed. So, um, I want to talk about um, what I believe will be the new paradigm for teacher uh, uh, development and training. Um, and before I do, I want to talk about uh, the old paradigm and a couple of more recent paradigms. Um, so there are three in particular. The old paradigm we're all pretty familiar with. Uh, they, it goes back about 115 years. Uh, the, Normal schools or the schools of education were uh, founded to develop teachers um, uh, around the turn of the 20th century uh, in big numbers across the country. And they focused on theory. Um, they gave students maybe five weeks of student teaching in their senior year. Um, they were not particularly focused on teaching content. And um, I remember uh, right after Arne Duncan became the Secretary of Education, he stood up at Columbia Teachers College and said that after 100, 110 years uh, and 1,400 schools of education around the country, there is very little evidence that they have been producing teachers who have been getting results for kids. Uh, it was a damning um, moment. And uh, this at a time when 70% of America's teachers major in education uh, as undergraduates. That's the old paradigm. It's probably outlived its usefulness. It is the opposite of what I just saw this morning at High Tech High Graduate School of Education. Over the past 25 years, we are all familiar with the second paradigm, which is meant to be a corrective, which is essentially to go out and recruit uh, some of the top college graduates who are not majoring in education and bring them immediately into teaching, to drop them into the deep end of the pool and to train them to teach while they're teaching full time. The advantage of this is, of course, that we're getting uh, really strong uh, college students to go into teaching. And this is important because in the United States, 24% uh, of our teachers are top third college graduates. And in low-income communities, it's 11%. So organizations like Teach for America and the charter schools who are bringing in uh, TNTP, who are bringing in these top college graduates, uh, have been doing a great thing. And it's pretty hard to imagine the education reform that we've seen over the past 25 years without this injection of talent. But as a teacher pipeline strategy, uh, it suffers from not providing optimal training for people before they're teaching full time. So the work at Relay over the past five to eight years has largely been training people in an alternative certification uh, moment where we are essentially working with full-time teachers in their first and second year, training them, getting them certified, getting them a master's degree. It's incredibly difficult. What I've noticed, what we've noticed over this period of time is something that um, a bunch of folks have figured out probably over the past uh, 10 or so years, which is similar to the medical residency model, which is a teacher residency model, which is instead of putting somebody into teaching uh, full time in their uh, first year, you give them a gradual on-ramp where they go through a series of gateways over the course of a year. You place them in the classroom of a really strong teacher, and you train them um, in the locus of the classroom and the school um, but you also are giving them a lot of the rigorous background content knowledge 
uh, that you would want in a, a really rigorous um, school of education. That's the third, that's the third paradigm. And uh, so at Relay, probably of the 2,000 teachers that we'll have in our program in 11 cities next year, about 500 of them will be these, uh, these residents. Um, so that's great. About 70% uh, of them are black and Latino. They tend to be from the communities uh, um, uh, where they're teaching. And uh, they have uh, aspiration to be teachers over the long term in the profession. And, um, uh, are presenting themselves in their first year of teaching as, uh, as uh, really strong classroom managers, which is great because the vast majority of people who are going to teaching in traditional programs feel totally, report that they're unprepared to teach on the first day. So um, that's probably the direction that our training will and should go over time. Um, but I think there's one fundamental problem with, uh, with that paradigm that will get corrected by what I believe is the fourth paradigm of how we'll be developing teachers in the future. And that is um, that when, um, when people are 18 years old, 40% of them think about teaching as their future profession. But by the time they're 22 or 23, it's only 10% which means that we collectively are losing three quarters of our potential teachers during their undergraduate years at a time when 70% of our teachers major in education as undergraduates. In addition, um, when I travel around the country, so the, the idea here is that we need to start talking to future teachers and match them to the profession when they're 18 and 19 years old, when they're seniors in high school and freshmen in college. This is what I fundamentally believe. And um, this requires us to think much more locally and less about importing teachers uh, from some other place. When I travel around the country, I find superintendents and um, people who are leading various charter schools and organizations perpetually fantasize that people from, oh, I don't know, California, say San Diego, are going to come to San Antonio or El Paso or Rochester, New York, and teach there. And if only they could magnetize the talent from other places, they would have a winning talent strategy. But the truth is that the future of the Rochester, New York public schools or the El Paso Texas public schools are in Rochester and El Paso, and they need to look at uh, their, their seniors in high school and their freshmen in college. I say this because 61% of teachers in their first job are teaching 15 miles from where they went to high school. And 37% are teaching in their first job uh, 15 miles from where they went to college. So we are only going to dig ourselves out of the talent problem by focusing on developing our local talent for these teacher positions um, and to do that early. 15% um, of America's uh, teachers are black and Latino at a time when 40% of our students are black and Latino. And so if we couple a local uh, hiring strategy with looking for people who look like the students in an undergraduate pathway, we have a far better chance at getting diversity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, 70% of the teachers in our residency program are black and Latino. And finally, um, there's an um, economist at uh, University of Missouri, Corey Kotel, who um, did a study at three major research institutions and found that um, those students who major in classes like biology and chemistry and physics and can't hack it in order to graduate change their major to education. And those who are majoring in education who feel like they are not uh, challenged transfer into other fields. And yet students on these campuses are getting higher grades 
uh, in their education programs than these other fields, and they feel unprepared when they go out. Uh, and at a time uh, of common core, when we see the bar being raised across the country on content, uh, we need people to major in the subjects that they are going to go and teach. And so, given all this, I think the future paradigm is going to look something like this. Um, there will be uh, courses or mini courses uh, uh, at high schools around the country that introduce seniors who are interested to the possibility of teaching and give them some responsibility to do some teaching uh, in their senior year. Secondly, there will be courses that are offered, and we've got one at Relay uh, in cooperation with Tulane University in New Orleans, where in their freshman year, students will be invited to be inspired about what you can do to change uh, the trajectory of kids' lives in teaching. And so there'll be inspirational freshman seminars or courses. Third, um, there will be um, very well-coordinated service programs for which you can get work-study money and college credit to tutor students in school while you're a college student. This is something that we're doing uh, at Relay in both uh, Houston uh, and New Orleans, a tutor core. Third, fourth, um, summers. So like you can real the barrier to entry on innovation uh, in the summer is incredibly low. So organizations like Summer Bridge, Breakthrough Collaborative, uh, now it's called, uh, have already figured this out for 35 years. You give high school students and college students a chance to teach during the summer. Uh, I've recently helped launch an organization called Generation Teach, which is doing this in Denver and Boston. And Relay is starting to do this in New Orleans this summer. But I imagine that tens of thousands of college students and maybe some high school students will get their first introduction to the possibility of teaching in the summers while they're in college. For a very modest stipend, continue the learning for kids in the summer, and really give folks a chance to explore teaching as a career. Fifth, and this is where I think the um, favorable economics comes in and the really strong matching uh, um, to the profession is uh, my daughter, um, in her junior year in college, went off to Moscow for a semester. Um, uh, you, you probably have kids of your own uh, or will who are go off to other places around the world, junior year abroad, study away programs are pretty common. What we really need to do is to create semester and year long programs where students in college have a chance to go to Memphis and Camden and Kansas City to try teaching. And the residency model that we're using for graduates can be applied uh, to the undergraduates, and they can get a very similar experience where they can start to go through various gateways and practice teaching. The idea is that by the end of their experience, they know, I like to teach, I'm good at teaching, the school is giving them a job offer, they're on the pathway to certification and maybe a master's degree, and when they arrive on their first day of teaching a whole class, they will have been so much better prepared than the vast majority of folks who do not have the practical um, experiences. We probably shouldn't stop there. So if we could um, generate a new pipeline of folks like this coming into the teaching profession uh, and get them to go work in our uh, schools uh, that are serving low-income students in big numbers. Um, we should avoid the traps that we see happening uh, across the country, which is to put new teachers in the most challenging schools. Rather, we should give them a chance to develop their craft in reasonably well-performing, higher-functioning schools and classrooms so they can practice getting good 
before they're going to the most challenging situations. We need principals who will maximize on the work that the teacher prep programs are doing by going into the classrooms, visiting the teachers, observing them, and giving them feedback. The data point that astonishes me the most in public education today, the average American principal spends a grand total of six minutes a day observing and giving feedback to teachers. That's not per teacher, that's all the teachers in the school. So if you're gonna spend all the effort to recruit talent, match talent, hire talent, prepare talent, have the talented people practice, and you put them in schools where their supervisor is not observing them, not giving them feedback, we should not be surprised that half of our teachers in the United States of America are running for the exits in their first five years. And so the continuum of experience from the preparation to in school is crucial. Again, why I was so impressed with what I saw at uh, High Tech High Graduate School of Education this morning. And then the ongoing professional development, uh, the training should not stop with just the new teachers. We need a couple hundred thousand teachers a year, maybe 165,000 teachers a year, which means that 5% um, of America's teachers are in their first year. But that means 95% are not. And TNTP tells us that the American public schools are spending on average $18,000 per teacher per year in professional development with no impact. So if we're gonna to go to all the trouble of recruiting and training and observing and giving feedback to these teachers, we have got to improve the cycle of professional development in the schools where our folks are going. Um, I think the last thing that I'd say is, um, on this score, is uh, that the economics of the residency model on the first blush seems expensive. Um, you're thinking on average it's probably about uh, $20,000 to train the teacher and something like a $30,000 stipend for the person to recruit somebody good during their first year. Um, and there are a bunch of people who are trying to puzzle on how you go and do that. Ultimately, if you use the residency model right, you should be getting better results and having people staying longer over time, which would justify the increased investment by the district in the short run. But we all know that long-term economical thinking is not the hallmark of the average uh, school district in the country. Um, one of the key advantages of the undergraduate pathway, not the only one, but a key one is that undergraduates, whether through Pell Grants, state aid, uh, tuition, are essentially paying for their experiences, and you can essentially uh, embed the training in an undergraduate education which already has its baked in costs and significantly bring down the cost to the district of the ready teacher coming into the profession. Um, so uh, not only do you have a better method of training teachers, but presumably you'll have a favorable economics. I believe that universities across the country will start to figure out how to uh, do this, how to adopt these particular strategies and the residency model in their undergraduate uh, programs. They need partners in districts and schools so that they can create a really good experience, um, but we need to dramatically uh, change the, um, the experience for folks um, uh, across the country in order to improve the experience for our kids across the country. Um, that's my thought about where we're going forward. Uh, I wish you all well. Thank you very much.